Pancreatic Cancer Medicine Research in Focus series, I talk to various ICM members about their research and how it is supported by the vision of the Mark Foundation Institute for Integrated Cancer Medicine. MFICM research uses cutting-edge analytics to maximise the use of diverse high-volume data sets and by capturing cancer heterogeneity in time and space in patients receiving active treatment. Integrated Cancer Medicine aims to transform the way the world treats cancer by affecting patients along their treatment pathway and ultimately accelerate cures. Today I have with me Professor Robert Rintel and Lauren Wallace to talk about biosampling, what it is and why it is so important both from a patient's treatment and a research perspective. Robert Rintel is Professor of Thoracic Oncology in the Department of Oncology at the University of Cambridge and Honorary Consultant Respiratory Physician at Royal Papua Hospital. Lauren Wallace is Translational Research Manager in the Urological Malignancies Programme at the University of Cambridge. So thank you very much for joining me today. To start with Robert, can you tell us what biosampling is and what different sample types are possible to collect? Well, broadly speaking, biosampling is collecting, in our case, samples from humans. These might be blood samples, for instance, breath samples, samples of fluid such as urine or fluid around the lining of the lung. They could be biopsy samples from just about any part of the body you can think of. And from those samples, you can then make various derivatives. For instance, you can take a blood sample and you can look at the plasma or the serum. You can look at the DNA. You can look at the circulating tumor DNA. That is biosampling. And then if you store those samples, you bank them in effect. So that is biobanking. Biosampling obviously happens in effect during routine clinical care when you're taking any sample for whatever purpose you need for looking after that patient's care. But you may also, probably more in the context we're talking here, is for subsequently storing those samples for research purposes. They may be taken at baseline, at an index point, or taken at various points during the patient journey. Let's say you take some baseline samples before an operation, you would then operate on a patient for something, let's say taking out a cancer. You may then collect more samples further down the line and look at the longitudinal effect. Thank you. And are all these different types of samples collected routinely from a cancer patient? They're not collected routinely, no, other than, as I mentioned, the samples we would collect for managing that patient's care. But additional samples that you might want to collect for research purposes are not collected routinely. You may collect samples inside a clinical study or clinical trial of some sort where your patient has consented uh, as part of that study to have biosamples collected and banked, as I said, maybe before the treatment and then at various time points subsequently. You can also sometimes collect samples and use samples which are excess to normal requirements. So we also have at Royal Papworth Hospital, for instance, under the Human Tissue Authority, we're allowed to use samples which are excess to clinical requirements for research purposes, as long as that research study has been approved by an internal committee in our research tissue bank. There are different approaches you can take. So they're not collected routinely. There are some attempts or there have been discussions about collecting samples routinely from all patients undergoing everything and collecting huge collections of tissue and samples. The issue with that is there's no point in going to the great time and effort and expense of collecting these samples if you don't use them. And historically, certainly I have in the past collected samples routinely, but then we found we weren't really using them that much. So actually what we tend to do now is collect samples around the clinical study where we have specific questions and we want to answer those questions and to do so we need those samples. The other thing I should say is that a sample, whatever it is, is very valuable, but it is hugely more useful if we have associated clinical data and information to go along with that sample. Uh, now that may be the demographics of the patient. It may be to say this is a female aged 55, Caucasian, used to smoke, so on and so forth. 
And on top of that, you then might have clinical information about their condition that they currently have or their past medical history or the medications they take or their family history and so on. And if you can collect that data, either at baseline or even if in a more sophisticated approach longitudinally as well to match your samples as you collect those longitudinally, uh, that then gives you a really, really valuable resource. But as you can imagine, that is pretty time consuming and expensive to do and therefore is best done if you've got specific questions you want to address within a clinical trial. That makes sense. So just one small part of the whole patient picture and a whole patient journey. Yeah. I guess we've you've talked about it a little bit already, but why is it so important to collect samples at these different stages? For years and years, we've we've treated patients with a variety of clinical conditions with treatments, and they may or may not have, you know, got better and improved. But often we haven't really understood why someone responds to a treatment or doesn't respond to a treatment. And now if we collect these samples and we start to unlock the secrets of their genomics, drug resistance patterns for tumors and that sort of thing, a, a whole array of questions you can ask, we can then potentially make sure we're treating the right patient with the right treatment for the right reasons and trying to avoid unnecessary and inappropriate treatments. So the more we can find out about how individual people respond to treatments, the better. And these biosamples that you can collect before and after treatments are beginning to tell us far more. You can get a lot from baseline. What can we tell looking at their genomics, their proteomics, the transcriptomics, and so on, all the, all the many omics that we can now uh, have and integrating all that together. Uh, but again, you know, longitudinally, why do some patients who apparently have a complete resection or response to their cancer, then develop relapsed disease some point down the line. Why do others respond extremely well to chemotherapy uh, and others don't? So there are many, many questions in cancer medicine and beyond in many areas of medicine that we can begin to answer with these biosamples. Thank you. And Lauren, if I can bring you into the conversation, can you tell me how the samples are collected? So there's two different elements I could answer this question with. So the first, how are they collected? Within the Neurological Malignancies Program, we collect our samples at different time points depending on the study. So sort of give you examples. If we have a surgical patient, as Robert mentioned, we have really precious baseline samples, which will be taken prior to the surgical event happening. This could be biopsy, this could be full resection of the kidney. And what we do is we'll meet with patients in clinic. This ties in quite nicely when the patient is visiting. Obviously, they're coming in for a normal consultation with the doctor prior to their surgery um, to discuss surgical plan, to have their pre-assessment. And what we like to do, and, and what I think especially important now, is to get more patients into these studies and these clinical trials by making it a bit more appealing in the sense that they'll provide samples when they're already providing standard of care samples. So what I mean by this is you'll already be required to have a blood test done as part of your surgical plan. And basically what we ask as a research team is to have, for example, blood samples. They'll be taken at the same time you're already having a needle inserted into your arm. So it's no extra pain or visits for the patient. And a lot of people are pretty happy to provide those kind of samples. And like I say, it makes it more appealing. People can, can participate in this way. Um, so we'll see patients, as I mentioned, after their clinic appointment. We'll often get blood and urine during this time. Or alternatively, this can happen on the day of their surgery. On the morning of their surgery, they'll come in when they're on the ward before they go into theatre. Uh, we'll see them then and we'll collect, again, blood and urine prior to surgery when they're already providing a urine sample for, again, clinical purposes. That's one pathway that can happen. The other way as well that we're trialling, and it's quite exciting actually for us, we're trialling a pilot where patients are going in to park a ride up in, for example, Newmarket, close to Cambridge. And we're basically providing packs to patients whether they're already on site, we provide the pack in person, or what we're doing is we're identifying patients on some of our studies uh, and our clinical trials where we can actually send the pack to the patient. If you're going to your GP, a lot of the time nowadays, the doctor will provide you with a pack and you'll take the pack to your GP. And very similar way, we'll ask with a research pack to take to park and ride. And then again, the park and ride uh, staff will very kindly take the samples for us, for example, blood samples. Uh, and then they're couriered back to our lab directly at Addenbrooke's. And this is, a, like I say, a new thing, a new pilot. But yes, exciting times ahead for, for research in that respect. And it will make it even more accessible to people to provide these research samples. 
Sure, you're essentially making the most of contact with patients for research as well as for their treatment journey. Yeah, one thing that's quite common is people don't want to have to make extra journeys to hospital. Especially now we're coming out of the COVID pandemic, it's really important for patients to feel safe. And if they're already, like I say, coming in for a single visit, we won't ask them to come in for any additional visits. We'll always see them when they're already here. So again, it's, it's accessible for patients. Makes sense. And then what, why did they go and what are they used for? So as Robert mentioned, there's lots of different samples we can collect from people. Blood samples, most of the time, obviously, are not just taken to the lab and frozen as they are. Often samples are stored at minus 80, provides the basically the most longitudinal lifespan of the sample. Alternatively, what, what tends to happen, I think, with most studies is that blood samples, um, if we focus on them, they are processed. And so you get elements like uh, whole blood, plasma, and an element called buffy coat. Those are your most common samples you'll get from blood. They are either immediately analysed or they're stored and frozen. As Robert mentioned, they're biobanked. They're stored at minus 80 or alternatively at minus 30. Or even alternatively, you also have liquid nitrogen, which is used as well. So in clinical samples, we store it down to minus 180. That just, again, provides the most long life for the samples and, and ensures that those clinical samples have the highest amount of integrity when they do come to be processed. In terms of what they're used for, Samples can be used for lots of different things. So you will have people that will be looking at genetics, people that will be looking at proteins, cytokines as well. Something we're looking into in the Neurological Malignancies Programme. And it's for our listeners, Laura, tell us what a cytokine is. So a cytokine is an important inflammatory marker. It's prevalent in blood plasma. Specialist lab will analyse the cytokine content of the blood plasma, which is important because we're looking at the inflammatory response. And can I ask you, how long do you keep samples? I imagine it varies, does it? So the length of time in which samples will be kept depends on the study in which the patient will consent for. You will find that on most study information sheets that patients are provided with, they will be told a specific number. This can really vary. It can vary from a year, five years, 10 years, 25 years, and in long cases. It also depends on the sample you're talking about. So this obviously will vary for blood, urine, and tissue. Tissue tend to be kept a lot longer than blood or urine because it has many different uses. It can be formalin fixed. Essentially what this means is that it's a paraffin material, kind of like wax, in which the tissue is preserved and they last for a really, really long time. And there's lots of different analytical techniques that you can use on, on FFPE tissue is what it's called, which stands for formalin fixed paraffin embedded tissue. They can be turned into slides. And what I mean by that is with the paraffin block of tissue, it can essentially be sliced into the most minute slides of tissue, which again can be popped under a microscope and there's lots of different things that you can see uh, and lots of different dyes that can be used to flag up different biomarkers which is very useful for different types of studies yeah that makes sense Robert what do you think patients think about sample collection the most consent straight away do they realize how important their samples are from a research perspective overall my experience of patients in this regard is that they're remarkably altruistic and want to help obviously I work in the cancer field and that may be Patients with cancer are, are particularly keen to be as helpful as they can, both you know, hoping to improve their own position, maybe with new research and particularly for others in the future. As many patients do appreciate that research takes many years, so the samples they're donating uh, may not directly lead to research, which is going to benefit them, but hopefully will benefit generations to come. So generally, I uh, find patients are, are very, very helpful. As Lauren has mentioned, we try, particularly within trials where we're doing longitudinal sampling, to coordinate those samples with clinical visits. So I'm running one study at the moment over a several year period in the follow-up for patients who've had previous lung cancer surgery. And generally the patients come back every six months to see us, the, see the clinical team. And we time the visits for the biosampling with the clinical visits. So they might come in half an hour early, have 40 mils of blood taken that we need for the, our research. Uh, and then they see the clinical team and then they go again. So people are very kind and helpful, but for the same token, we try to make life as easy as we can. Generally, my experience is if you make things as simple as possible for patients and also for your clinical colleagues, then you'll be more successful. And the same applies to, you know, busy surgeons who are operating. I'm often asking surgeons to collect samples for me 
for lung cancer cases or mesothelioma cases. And you've got to keep it really simple because when the surgeon is in the middle of an operation, the last thing they need to think about now is what does that, you know, Robert wanted 43 different pots filled with different things. So you, you keep it nice and simple all color coded. So the, you know, the scrub nurses in theater can see immediately see what's required. And if you do that, uh, and I speak from bitter experience of things that haven't worked and what you learn over time, if you make it as simple as possible, generally it works. It makes total sense. <laughs> can I ask you what a typical sampling event looks like? So obviously we've touched on the fact that it's not always surgical, but is there a time limit? Do you have to do things quickly? How does that work? Sometimes you can collect a sample, for instance, a clotted blood sample where you can then freeze it and you've got plenty of time to do things with it. But often what we do actually is collect a sample and then process it, what we call near patient processing. So you might want to spin the sample in a centrifuge and take off the plasma, the serum, the buffy coat fractions on a blood sample, for instance. Or you might have a, a sample of urine where you want to spin down the pellet and get the cells out and then take the supernatant off or uh, pleural fluid. So sometimes samples have to be dealt with quite quickly. The other example there is when we're making a cell line that actually we need to get the fresh material in tissue culture media into the laboratory quickly in order to try and develop the cell line because often it's much harder to develop cell lines from human tissue or some fluid samples if they've been sitting around for very long. So there is a degree of urgency. In Papworth, we've recently built a mini laboratory and we put in a category two hood and centrifuges and so on. So now we can take the samples from the patients in the phlebotomy room, 20 yards down the corridor and spin the bloods straight away. And we have a technical team in there who do that to very high standards and everything is quality controlled and quality assured because it is really, really critical when you collect these samples to make sure that what you're collecting has been handled really, really carefully and well to standard operating procedures so that things are reproducible over time. Because if you're collecting many samples for a study over, let's say, a couple of year period, you want to make sure that the samples on day one are as good as the samples at the end of the study so you don't get batch effects and this sort of thing. Or you try and minimize these things. Uh, and again, if you're collecting, as you do often for multi-site studies, if you're collecting at different sites up and down the land, you want your samples to be as similar as possible in every respect. So that whatever you do with your sample downstream is reproducible and is validated. There are a few exceptions where you might want to collect samples in a way that they have to be processed instantly. There is one a technique, for instance, just to give listeners an example, it's called snap freezing, where you take a sample, maybe a biopsy sample, and you just drop it straight into liquid nitrogen, which you've got beside you. So the surgeon takes a piece of tissue, which one moment is in the patient, connected to the patient, and within 10 seconds, it has been snap frozen in liquid nitrogen and all the processes going on inside the cells in that piece of tissue have been instantly stopped so that you don't get any degradation of the sample and the processes. However, that is a bit more challenging nowadays because having containers of liquid nitrogen uh, around in operating theatres and so on can be done, but has its potential hazards and it has to be done very carefully. And in fact, within our mesothelioma biobank, mesobank, we actually took a different approach and we use something called RNA later, where the samples go straight into RNA later and preserve them like that, which is safer than using liquid nitrogen because some trusts now don't like having liquid nitrogen for understandable reasons in these environments. Yeah, makes sense, especially with the safer alternative. Yeah, absolutely. Lauren, did you have anything to add to that? Yeah, it was a really good point by Robert, actually. It's really relatable when you're talking about taking samples during the surgical event. So one of our clinical trials, WIRE, we actually take samples during the surgery. In a similar process, as Robert mentioned, you're freezing that environment in which the tissue is living, freezing it immediately in liquid nitrogen. We're taking about six cores. When I say core, I mean it's microscopic. It's a couple mils, if that, of tissue. Get snap frozen and it's so vitally important for downstream analysis, particularly things like RNA. RNA is particularly degradable and it has to be handled very carefully to be able to get meaningful results um, from it. So it's it's very important. 
Just to add something a bit extra in here, sampling events, obviously, as Robert mentioned, can happen all over the country. Particularly for us, we have a, a clinical trial which is ran by UCL in London called Rampart. One of my jobs with Rampart is that we provide sort of a, a base for samples to be sent to. Typically, we could receive up to 20 of, if not more, samples per week from external sites across the UK in which blood samples are being sent. And that is a logistical challenge in itself, something that, you know, is not necessarily something typically think of when they think of sampling in terms of them being sent around, providing the right equipment to sites, knowing exactly how to handle the samples uh, and obviously processing the samples appropriately once they arrive at the site are all things that are important. That's interesting. That ties into my next question, which is what are the challenges around obtaining samples? So obviously you've alluded to sometimes they're taken off site. Is there anything else you'd like to, to tell us about in terms of challenges? I think there are quite a lot of challenges actually in, in research sampling. I think when you think of it on the face of things, you might think it's quite an easy task, but as Robert mentioned, you've got to have appropriately trained individuals. And I think it's important to mention that you need to have dedicated individuals as well that are dedicated to providing that biosampling pathway, particularly as we mentioned in surgical events where things need to happen pretty quickly. Um, and there's a lot of communication that has to go on between the research assistant um, typically and the surgeon. Without those relationships and without that communication, things wouldn't work as smoothly and you certainly wouldn't get the results or even the research and subsequent changes to medicine that you would have without it. What with the pandemic, it's, it's been more challenging than ever, I think uh, would be appropriate to say, uh, simply because we haven't had the patients coming in. I think it's fair to say as well that at the beginning of the pandemic, a lot of studies, if not most research, was completely frozen. So recruitment was halted, for example. Uh, which means there are no new patients coming in and even trying to follow up previous patients. There were challenges there because, again, we're not going to ask patients to come in for no reason. And, and a lot of the time with the pandemic, patients were asking just to carry on with telephone consultations. So there wasn't the actual face-to-face -face contact. So obtaining samples in that way was pretty hard, I think. It was pretty difficult. And not only that, uh, there's a lot of challenges, I think, with storage as well. It's like Robert mentioned, it's fantastic to have lots of samples and the most valuable ones are the ones where you're asking yourself these primary and secondary endpoints, where you're evaluating exactly what you want to get out of the samples in terms of the questions you're asking. When you have so many samples and you have quite large biosampling studies, so just to give you an example, we run um, a study called ARTIS. ARTIS is one of our big studies. Um, so to give you an idea, we've recruited over 378 patients since January last year. Uh, there's a lot of follow-up samples and that's a lot of baseline samples. You actually have to have a dedicated area to store these samples in. And again, there's a lot of logistics with ensuring that the samples are kept at the temperature that they're meant to be, freezer maintenance and, and liquid nitrogen maintenance as well. Um, and the training surrounding all of that is, is really important. And you need to have the capacity to be able to store the samples. And it's really important in terms of ethics, how you plan to store them and where you plan to store them over a long period of time. A lot of the time, studies like to have an ongoing analysis where they'll have a, a batch of samples and then they plan to do analysis on them and it kind of moves that conveyor of samples along. There are times where you'll have lots of samples but you need to know exactly where you're going to be storing them and that can be in external sites away from the hospital for example for us. So I was going to ask you how you tackle governance and ethics so perhaps Robert could you touch on that as well as telling us any other challenges that you face? There are the strict governance and ethics around biosampling, biobanking and all human tissue is, is regulated by the Human Tissue Authority in the UK, the HTA. And uh, you have to make sure that you uh, follow all their guidance and rules and that essentially that a sample piece of tissue, whatever it is, can be tracked from the moment it is collected to the moment it is finally used and that you know exactly where it is at every point along the way, up along the route. So, you know, to give an example, you might collect a sample from a patient uh, in Sheffield. It then gets processed there into various derivatives. Those then all come down to Cambridge. We store them, for instance, in our mesothelioma project, Mesobank, here near Cambridge. And then those samples or some of those samples may then be used by researchers who apply for a tissue or derivatives and for instance, those samples might go to San Francisco to be used in an experiment there in the, in the laboratory. So you have to know all the way through. So you have to be accountable for that. Patients have to be consented and have, you know, very clearly understand what samples they are, are donating and why. If that's within the clinical trial, they'll be consented to that clinical trial. If, as I mentioned earlier, some research 
tissue banks can collect samples outside uh, a clinical trial. So we do this at Papworth. For instance, all our patients having surgery at Papworth for heart or lung surgery are asked if they'll voluntarily agree to donate any samples which are excess to clinical requirements. So for instance, let's imagine you're doing a heart valve replacement on a patient and you're removing the diseased heart valve and putting in a, a new artificial valve. Some of that diseased heart valve, a portion of it, well, the pathologist will get the whole valve and will look at it and say, yes, this valve has failed due to previous infections such as endocarditis or it is due to wear and tear related to age and degeneration, but they don't need the whole valve to, to make that diagnosis. So they'll take a bit of it out, off and put it in the research tissue bank. And then if someone doing a research project comes along and says, you know, I would like to do some research on the aging process of aortic valves or mitral valves, then we can supply them with that. But again, patients have to give consent for that up front. And, you know, every single sample that is released, we have to go back and check the consent forms in place. The other thing just to mention is that when we're collecting these samples from patients, we on our consent forms now often have multiple different boxes for them to agree to, to sign because we might be saying, okay, can we take some tissue from you or some fluid from you for the research purposes? But where we're now making cell lines or cell models from these samples as well, which might be used downstream and might be given out to various research groups around the world who might then use them for various purposes. And of course, you can't always control exactly what a research group on the other side of the world is going to do with the sample you've collected. So we have to be very open with the patients as to what their samples might be used for and give people the option to opt out of various parts of it if they wish to. That makes sense. So on one of our studies, we have it as an optional component to do cell lines. It's, a, it's an art in itself, making a consent form robust enough that it covers every aspect that you're asking that the patient is fully aware of. And it also adds in optional components. So for example, significant discoveries from DNA or cell lines, really bringing in the whole voluntary aspect of, of research. The other issue is around whether patients are identifiable or not, or whether samples are de-identified. This is a hot topic currently. Generally in clinical trials and research tissue banks, the samples are collected and stored, but then are given a unique identifier. So that when those samples go to the research laboratory, and for instance, might be used here in the, in the Cancer Institute where I'm sitting at the moment, no one in the Cancer Institute has any idea that that sample uh, actually came from Robert Rintoul originally. Now they might know that this is a, a 55 year old male Caucasian, and they might know about the past medical history and that supply, but they have no idea that it is Robert Rintoul. So we go to great lengths to de-identify these samples. Only the clinical teams actually have the link. That, of course, brings challenges if you're collecting longitudinal data and samples because everything has to be then united. So you have to make sure that your sample you've got in front of you and the clinical data you've got in front of you belong to the same person. So we go to, to great lengths uh, to do that, but also make sure that it is absolutely uh, safe and de-identified. And also that in the current climate, where we are doing more and more in-depth sequencing of patients, including whole genome sequencing, that patients have to be aware that, that when we're collecting their samples of what we might be doing down the line. And there's a degree of future proofing now that we have to do. 10 years ago, we weren't consenting all our patients saying we might do whole genome sequencing on them because back then it was very, very expensive to do. We didn't think we'd be doing it. But now the costs of this have come right down and it's feasible for doing it for patients on an individual basis. And the deeper you probe into genomics, the more you can find out about people whether they're predisposed to various illnesses or whether they carry various mutations and things that it might have potential impact for those patients or their families. But if they de-identify that linkage is broken, but people have to know what they are potentially donating their samples for. The regulation around this is, is quite rightly getting tighter and tighter, and we're having to be 
very, very careful how we do things. So quite complex governance are being put in place nowadays. Yes, I can see that it's very tricky to future-proof because you don't know where research will be in 10 years' time, but you still might be using the sample from 10 years ago. So, yeah, I can see that being a challenge. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I, I've mentioned Mesobank a couple of times. I said earlier that generally we collect the samples within a clinical trial or a clinical study where you know, as Lauren said, what your objectives and aims are and you're collecting samples to then for instance, run tests or assays and answer specific scientific questions. Rainy day collection, as some people sometimes call it, where you just collect lots and lots of samples and then store them in your freezer and then think, I'm going to use them one day for something. As I've said, doesn't always work terribly well. And there are many freezers up and down the land full of samples that are never used. I always liken tissue banking or my way I try to run tissue banking is a bit like your current bank account as opposed to your deposit bank account. In your current account, you get paid each month, money comes into your account, and by the end of the month, you wonder where it's all gone. But it's gone off on useful things, and in the same way, you hope, and in the same way, your samples have been used in a useful way, as opposed to a deposit account where the money comes and you stick it in the account and you sit on it for 10 years doing nothing with it. So when we set up Mesobank, we were collecting mesothelioma samples from multiple centers around the UK, with the idea of then quality assuring them, curating them, and then making them available for mesothelioma research groups globally. And the whole idea of Mesobank when we set it up was to provide high quality material with good clinical data in an area where there was limited material available and research groups working on mesothelioma were being impeded because they just didn't have the clinical material to work on. However, in effect, we were collecting in all these samples, not knowing at that point where they would go out to or who would want them. So the way we got around this, which you could argue is a type of rainy day collection, was to go out to the community and say, right, we're going to set up Mesobank, but we've got to work out very, very carefully in advance what samples we're going to collect to make sure that they are really useful in five years or 10 years' time, whenever people want them, to give them that future proof, as it were. So we did that. We, we worked out very carefully what samples to collect to cover as many eventualities as we possibly could. And actually, I'm very pleased to say it's working really, really well. We started collecting in 2014. We collected a lot of samples over the next few years, and then we started releasing material in about 2016. And here, five or six years later, uh, we've now supplied nearly 50 research groups around the world with a variety of mesothelioma samples. And a number of research groups have come back to us for more material, which I take as a sort of general you know, assurance that it seems to be good quality material and they, and they want some more of it. And I'm pleased to say that almost always we can supply the material that people want for their work and that with the various you know complex omics some of which weren't even being thought of really when we started the material is stu still suitable for that work but that ha did take a lot of thought and careful planning so it can be done but as hopefully people realize listening to this there is an awful lot behind biosampling and biobanking to do it really really well it is a real industry in itself. I can see that. And what a great success story. I mean, thank you for sharing that with us. That's fantastic. Lauren, you've mentioned a little bit how the pandemic has affected your ability to take samples. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Of course. The pandemic has caused issues with sampling for obvious reasons. Because we don't have the face-to-face -face contact as much as we did before the pandemic, a lot of things are now done telephone or video consultations. What's quite common is people will have their samples. So for example, blood or even urine will be taken at their GP or they'll be going to places like Park and Ride, uh, which is why we're trying to come up with new creative ways of getting samples from these patients still without causing them any extra visits. The main challenge is the face-to-face -face contact has, has been greatly reduced, but this also has repercussions on other things as well. So for example, whereby you might have had that face-to-face -face contact. And as Robert mentioned, you have to have clinical data to go hand in hand with your samples. Every time you have a follow-up visit for a patient, you will also fill out a nice load of paperwork, which identifies 
relevant clinical data, for example, if they've had changes to medications that are relevant to what you're studying, if they've had any new diseases that might be outside the arena of, of cancer, uh, but are clinically relevant and things like progression and, and things where you can talk with your patient and gather relevant clinical history, I think is the most appropriate way of, of putting it. It's harder to get their clinical data now. So what happens is we spend a lot more time on the phone to patients, uh, which isn't always logistically possible because just like us, patients are busy and not always free between typical working hours. And so you, sometimes it's a struggle to get that clinical data. Without the clinical data to go hand in hand with your samples, your samples are worth half as much because you need that clinical data. Pre-pandemic, we would be able to have the patient in clinic with us. We'd be able to sit down and have a face-to-face -face conversation, which as a researcher and trying to look at it from a patient's perspective as well, I think it's nicer to have the face-to-face -face contact because you're with the person and you get more of a sense of who they are. I personally find it's easier to talk to patients in a face-to-face -face manner rather than on the phone. You kind of lose out on that building patient relationships. And it's particularly important when you're seeing patients who might be coming into hospital quite frequently, but not necessarily at times where you can talk with them. They might be having treatments and some treatment sessions will run on a Saturday, which unfortunately for us, we don't collect samples on a Saturday. So we'll miss the patient. But we're still talking to them regularly enough that we're trying to build their relationship. But there are slight challenges, I think, which have definitely been induced by the pandemic. Yeah, thank you. Could do that. Robert, can you tell me, how do you see sampling developing in the future? I think that more and more we're going to sample at multiple time points along a patient's journey, pre and post treatments, and sometimes in cancer medicine. They have their baseline sample, their tumor sample. They then might have chemotherapy or radiotherapy and they have a good response and then they have a period when they appear to be in remission and they have their recurrent disease so you're sampling all the way through so we get a much better idea of how tumors evolve and develop and changes in the person over time around these changes in the tumor as the tumor evolves i think we're moving into an era when rather than cancer being a short sharp acute illness as it has been for many people with many cancers now certainly an example in lung cancer over the last few years an advanced disease where many of my patients would present with stage four disease and sadly would have died within a year 18 months well actually we're almost turning lung cancer into a chronic disease with people living for well, several years with the new treatments of molecularly targeted therapies and immunotherapies and so forth. So huge differences. So, so I think in that way, sampling will change. Interestingly, patients, and this happened a bit around mesothelioma, and I'm also aware of the PEACE study where patients are donating samples during life and after death as post-mortem sampling, that patients actually donate their bodies for sampling after death. And the PEACE study has been looking at that and collecting samples for various purposes. So I think that's one way. And the other thing I think is the integration of the sample. So as, as we said, historically, often samples were collected without much clinical data, but now there's far more information available and also linked with other things such as imaging data. So we haven't mentioned imaging so far, but actually linking imaging to the biosamples and the clinical data. So you have radiomics as well in within radiology is another burgeoning area. And I guess as more and more technologies develop, it may change the types of samples we collect. One area now that is beginning to develop are in effect developing what we call avatars of a patient's tumor. So you actually collect some tumor fresh process the tumor you then might develop a cell line or a tumor organoid which is a three-dimensional little cluster ball of cells which is a type of cell line which you are trying to replicate the patient's tumor outside their body so you can then perform laboratory tests on it and the development of tumor organoids has come on uh, dramatically in the last few years Things are moving, are changing quite rapidly. And I think, you know, it's a very interesting future. And hopefully, most importantly, and critically, of course, that this all feeds back to improve patient care and develop new treatments because it is a long cycle collecting these samples. I said earlier, it's an industry in itself. Well, that's even before you do your first experiment on the sample. 
And then there's all the laboratory research that goes on, which may take several years. So the whole cycle from those samples that are collected, informing maybe the design of a clinical trial as a result of sort of basic and translational research you've done on those samples, you then develop a clinical trial downstream and with an intervention that if that works, then might feed back into clinical practice. That whole cycle might take 10, 15, 20 years. So we've got to find ways of trying to speed up these cycles and get clinical translation from the bedside into the lab, to the bench, and then back to the bedside again and make that quicker. So when we're talking about the future sampling, I just want to add that it's a really exciting time to be involved in, in sampling because there are so many different technologies now that are being developed, even at the logistical level, um, when you're thinking about how the samples are processed. So for example, when you're processing things for a circulating tumor DNA, even the kits that are used, so these kits are obviously sold by third parties with different reagents in that you can use to process your samples. The technology is changing so much that it's exciting to see where it's going to go. Like Robert said, in 10 years' time, there could be completely different processes in place that make things 10 times better. And that's obviously the aim that we're all trying, we're hoping to get to that stage. It's very exciting to know or to, to wonder where it's going to go, to have all this research that is currently being carried out to be translated. You know, that's the goal of my, of my role, particularly to get translation from the lab to the bedside and ultimately change patient outcomes and improve people's health. Absolutely. I think I could talk to you two all afternoon. Thank you so much. It's been such an interesting conversation. I knew not, not a lot about biosampling and it's such an interesting and important area. So uh, thank you very much, both of you, for joining me today for this really, really interesting conversation. Thank, thank you. you. If you want to find out more about the work of the Mark Foundation Institute for Integrated Cancer Medicine, please visit our website at www.integratedcancermedicine.org, where you can find details of the ICM vision, all the current research, clinical trials, resources, publications, and team information. You can keep up to date with our latest news and events, and you can also sign up for our newsletter. If you would like more information about the work of the CRUK Cambridge Centre, please go to www.cirukcambridgecentre.org.uk or you can connect with us on Twitter using our handle at CIUK Cam Centre. Thanks for listening and do join us again soon.